Um, I've had a lot of requests recently for patients who wanted us to do tubal reversals for them. And uh, we've got a number of women who have kind of requested this and lined up um, when surgery is available again for elective procedures for us to do the tubal reversal. So just so we're all on the same page, a uh, substantial number of women will have a sterilization, uh, which is when you tie your tubes. And that can be done either with suture, with cautery, or with a little clip, usually called a filchy clip, or this little plastic ring, which is called a silastic ring. So when we use those and we tie the tubes, um, they can, in certain instances, be untied by surgically going in cutting the two segments of the tube which are still fresh and viable and then reattaching them without the blockage in the middle. It does require an operating microscope and if you looked at the ad for this week's show, you'll see that um, that's myself and uh, Dr. Carrie Mayrand operating on a patient with this giant kind of overhead microscope that we use to look and, and get a very close up zoomed view of the pelvis and that way we can use very, very fine suture it's an 8-0 suture, which is so thin, you actually have trouble seeing it without the microscope there. Um, and we use that to put the inner part of the tube together and then the outer part we do with a slightly thicker suture and then it all goes back together. You do have to have a, a bit of a surgery. Um, the incision's usually about three or four centimeters, maybe five or six if the patient's a little bit bigger. And then we go in and, and connect everything back together and you sew it all up. And we don't keep the patients in the hospital for that, we send them home. So the reversal is the undoing of the tying of the tube. Um, about 39 and a half percent of women will undergo sterilization during their lifetime. And we do know that many women regret it later on. Age, new partner, number of children that you've had, changes in your life circumstances, all can combine to lead to uh, regret or sort of um, you know not being as happy or content with the decision to do the tubal reversal. So the uh, or sorry the tubal ligation. So the reversal offers patients the opportunity to correct that or to undo that, and that way have a chance to conceive again. So the question is, if you're over 40, what's better? Is it better to untie your tubes or is it better to do IVF? And so there's a recent debate in Fertility and Sterility, our big fertility journal, that highlights this. Now there is some important information you need to know. As I mentioned, almost 40% of women will undergo sterilization and some estimates say it's as high as 50% at some point during their lifetime. So there are some critical elements to this discussion that are really important to highlight. Number one, if you have burned your tubes, or you've removed your tubes, um, with the burning it is very difficult to put them back together and with removal it's impossible. So this is only really specifying women who have either had their tubes tied, they've had their tubes clipped, or they've put on that little silastic ring. For the burning it's much more difficult, it is possible, it doesn't work as well, and obviously if your tubes have been removed it is not possible to put anything else there in its place. And we certainly don't do tubal transplants or anything like that as of yet. So bottom line is it applies to a small segment of women. From those women that have undergone that kind of tubal ligation, we know that about 14.3% will actually request information in the overall population for having a reversal or undergoing some type of fertility procedure such as IVF. And if you had the procedure when you were very young, less than 24, then that rate skyrockets to uh, almost 40%. So we know that there is a significant number of women who suffer from regret after having had their tubes tied for whatever reason, whether their life circumstances have changed, their partner has changed, or they just want another child and they're still in the same family relationship. So that then puts the impetus on, on us to be able to answer the question of, are we going to provide patients with IVF where we can bypass the tubes because we don't need them. We can make you make eggs, go into your ovaries, take out the eggs. Everything is done outside the body. You produce an embryo and the embryo then gets placed inside the uterus and you bypass the tubes entirely. Or should we offer these women a tubal reversal? So fertility and sterility took on this debate. Now it's interesting because their own guideline from many years ago says that the tubal reversal is actually the better way to go. 
Um, but there is some new data which is uh, interesting to at least examine and so we're going to talk about that tonight. So the first thing you need to know is obviously there's a demand and we've highlighted that tonight and talked about it. The second thing is that there, are, there is uh, differences in success. So when they've looked at the studies in regards to tubal reversal, there are actually 15. Now one of them is much, much bigger, involves thousands of patients, and the rest of them are much smaller. But overall, when you amalgamate all of the 15 studies together, you're ending up with a 41% pregnancy rate and a 35% live birth rate if you have the tubal reversal done. So that's the surgical approach to this. When you look at IVF, for women between 38 to 40, if you look at the American collaborative data, it's from an agency called SART, the Society for Assisted Reproductive Technology, um, it's close to about 40% for women between 38 to 40. For women between 41 to 42, you're looking at about 13.4%. And for women over 43, you're really looking at a less than 5% chance of success. So it does appear that there is a substantial difference in success. Now, if you look at that one study that involved the thousands of women, it's actually pretty equivalent. And if you're looking at women um, who are exactly 40 years of age, they actually seem to do a bit better than in that one study with the tubal reversal. But when you pool all of the studies together, it does appear that the tubal reversal actually may give you a bit of an advantage. When you look at the overall concept of this, the other big advantage in doing a reversal is that it's a cure for the problem of infertility, whereas IVF is a treatment for the problem of infertility. We cannot promise you that the treatment will work, nobody can, but you can promise that the tubes will become functional again. So there are some advantages there in terms of doing the reversal because you have now cured the infertility problem and most people would prefer a cure rather than a, um, a treatment. So it definitely makes a lot of sense to proceed with the cure approach than it does to the treatment approach. The one concern we have when we do tubal reversals is the chance that you can get an ectopic pregnancy. So an ectopic pregnancy is when the pregnancy is actually in the fallopian tube. It's stuck there, it can attach there, grow there, and if it grows in the tube, uh, that has two very significant uh, sort of implications. Number one, it is not viable and must be terminated. And number two, it frequently requires surgery because it can be life-threatening. And if you undergo life-threatening treatment, there is frequently the cause to take out the tube. So now you've paid to have your tube reversed and you have to go and remove the tube. So it is not an ideal situation. So the studies from the IVF side support the concept that uh, ectopic pregnancy risk is a little bit lower and it probably is when you're doing IVF. I've only had two, two ectopic pregnancies in our program over all the years that we've been doing it so it really is very very rare. Um, whereas with a tubal reversal I tell patients going into it that the chances are at a minimum 5% and possibly as high as 15. Now if you look at the studies they say it's somewhere between 2 to 6% for a tubal reversal and IVF is saying it's around 5% traditionally as well. But I definitely think that in my own experience, the chances of a reversal causing an ectopic are definitely higher than IVF. And certainly we use IVF for patients that have had multiple ectopics because it is a safer route of pregnancy for them than natural or insemination or tubal surgery. So I don't agree with the authors on that one. The pro-tubal side argued that it made a lot more sense to do the reversal because the numbers were essentially the same. I think that's probably not very realistic. I think the numbers probably favor IVF when it comes to your ectopic pregnancy risk. The last question is a question of cost. Now, um, this is an American study and I, just for entertainment purposes, for those of you that are Canadian, I will share the cost difference with you. The cost they said of IVF was to have one baby was $111,445 versus the tubal reversal, which somehow cost $218,742. Now clearly nobody is paying that much for their fertility care on a normal ongoing basis. 
and I only charge uh, somewhere between five and a half to six thousand Canadian to do a tubal reversal. So I have no idea where the cost of two hundred eighteen thousand came from. So it is definitely not that expensive. IVF is also not that expensive. But what you need to factor into this is that you may undergo the surgery. There's time off of work. Your partner may need to take time off of work. There may be uh, medications that you need to purchase for your recovery. Um, the recovery can take a fair bit of time. Most people take about six weeks off of work, so there's a, a component uh, there of time loss. Uh, maybe you now need a babysitter for existing children. Um, and same thing along the lines of IVF. You may have to get meds, you may need to try more than once. Um, you may do the tubal reversal, have an ectopic, and then end up needing IVF after all. Anyway, so all of these are factors that go into it. Nevertheless, uh, clearly on a one-to-one -one apples to apples comparison, um, a reversal costs about $6,000 and IVF will minimum cost you $10,000. Plus if you're over 40, which is the age group we're talking about, you then have to add in the fact that you now are adding in about $5,000 worth of medication and we do recommend the pre-implantation genetic testing for that age group, so that's another several thousand dollars. So 6,000 versus somewhere between, let's say, 10 to 20,000 for your IVF cycle, there is no question that the reversal will at least initially be cheaper on that apple to apple comparison. Now the one other aspect of this that's important is if you do it right at 40 and you're young, you may have enough time to have one or maybe two babies from doing a tubal reversal, assuming that your ovaries are functional and they're doing well and you're a healthy patient. Um, if you do IVF, and, and this is a big and, you produce enough eggs, you may have enough embryos to use later on that are still healthy and viable and can function, and so you could potentially have more than one child that way. The flip side can also be true though. So if you do your IVF cycle, and you only produce one embryo, you're now stuck with just the one normal embryo. Um, and so you're only gonna have the one chance, whereas if you do the reversal, you still have other chances down the line. And some people won't wait. They'll have one baby and then they'll breastfeed for maybe three to six months and then they'll be trying again almost immediately for another one. So they're having both children before they're actually uh, 43 years of age where it genuinely starts to become difficult. So the factor fiction this week was uh, what's better, a tubal reversal or uh, IVF for women over 40? And I think that the balance of the evidence actually supports an individualized decision. So I'm gonna cop out of this one a little bit this week. Um, we won't get that hammer we get in our videos. <laughs> There's no stamp for this one. So the reality is that, um, you know, you can really go either way. It very much depends on your ovarian function, your personal preferences, how your surgery was done initially. Did you actually have uh, cauterization of your fallopian tube or did they operate on it surgically and just clip it or tie it? Um, was it sewn at the time of C-section, um, etc.? And then you also need to know uh, all of the other aspects of your health and what your twos were like. Have you had chlamydia before? Have you had gonorrhea before? Was there endometriosis? All of these things can uh, alter things. The one important note here is that both groups arguing for both sides of this clearly stated that if you have more than just tubal factor as your diagnosis, so endometriosis, previous infection, recurrent pregnancy loss, diminished ovarian reserve, any of the other things, male factor that we deal with, IVF is a better option for you. So I think apples to apples, it's definitely cheaper to do a, rever a reversal and you can get very, very good success rates with it. And we've had a very high success rate in our program doing that but you do need to individualize this for your care. And some people actually may benefit a little bit more from doing IVF in particular if they have other issues going on. So uh, with that, I wanna do something I don't always do, which is not jump directly to your questions, but rather I wanna talk about two other really interesting studies that um, have given us uh, a bit of pause and a lot of information. So there is an as yet unpublished, but pre-released study 
on 12 men from China where they analyzed their semen for COVID-19. And all of these men had mild to moderate symptoms. So only one of them, uh, only, only one patient actually had severe symptoms. Everybody else had mild to moderate symptoms. And in that population, they actually showed absolutely no COVID-19 in the ejaculate. And one guy actually had a testicular biopsy and there was no, um, no positive virus or particles of the virus in the testes. So it does look like you cannot sexually transmit, at least from male to male or male to female, uh, the virus. And that's really, really important to know because obviously everybody's been asking, you know, what, what's the risk of getting pregnant at this time? At least